Our next speaker is Richard Ambrosini, who is Professor of English Literature in the Department of Foreign Languages, Literatures and Cultures at the University di Roma 3. He is the President of the Italian Association of Conrad Studies. Is that still true, Richard? I think this biography is perhaps, the biographical note is perhaps two years old, but anyway. Um, his books include Conrad's Fiction as Critical Discourse, Introduzione a Conrad, and R. L. Stevenson, La Poetica del Romanzo. Um, with Richard Dury, he is co-editor of Robert Louis Stevenson, Writer of Boundaries, which has already been mentioned this morning by Nathalie, and of uh, European Stevenson. Um, he, as well, aside from more than 20 essays on Stevenson, as well as on Conrad, he has written a number of essays ranging from Chaucer to Graham Greene, Shakespeare, Coleridge, Kipling, etc. And he is also a translator, and I'll just mention two of his Stevenson translations, Treasure Island and The Beach at Falesa. And he also has a lovely short title, Stevenson Versifier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good morning and thank you to the organizers for inviting me, accepting me. <laughs> but um, as you already understood, I'm so used to working mm -hmm. with Richard Judy and he has inspired, largely inspired my passion for Robert Louis Stevenson. So this is going to be a bivocal presentation. I will talk about Stevenson's poetry, but the most important part will be having you hear and see some poems I, collect, I selected, and Richard will lend us his voice. He will read them out to you eh? with great charm. Um, I'll always be grateful to Stevenson <coughs> because his essays allowed me, a non-English language native speaker, to appreciate more fully the beauty of English prose. This is why, I guess, for years I associated his artistic identity with a voice speaking in his essays and some of his letters. Stevenson was and remains for me the artist whose 1878 inland voyage was adopted in Eton for translations from English into Latin, and three years later, in 1881, turned into a popular author, when with Treasure Island he experimented a way to give pleasure to an intergenerational and interclass audience. I enjoy, enjoyed the challenge of defending his artistic identity while confronting the choices that shaped a production that was at times exalting and at times embarrassing. Who was Stevenson? Was he the, the author who collaborated with his stepson on three novels, The Wrong Box, The Wrecker, and The Eptide? Or was instead the man who in the very same years refused to romanticize the South Seas and stopped writing correspondences for the newspaper syndicates, syndicates that was paying for his cruise? It was the latter, of course, if you ask me. While preparing this paper, I came across um, Kate Green with the image of Kate Green's birthday book for children, and in Roger Lewis's excellent edition for Edinburgh University Press, I read Stevenson's reaction. These are rather nice rhymes, and I don't think they will be dealt too difficult to do. Yet again, my idealizing projection was being undermined. And this time, I didn't have a counter-narrative because I had never studied Stevenson's poetry. Today, I'm presenting that counter-narrative. I started in my study 
I started, of course, by reading Penny Fielding's chapter on poetry in the Cambridge Stevenson Companion to get an idea of the state of the art. Uh, my paper will be, I'll be conversing with her. I don't would say I'm trying to convince her, but I'm, she, and she, she gave me so many ideas and I want to thank her. Then I started reading all his poetry in the Lewis edition. Eh? I drew a line um, at those, poet, uh, those composition who had passed through the hands of his stepchildren. Um, he never chose to publish them. And I came across a dozen beautiful Barry Stevensonian poems, which I found far more enjoyable than those of, mo of some, most of his English contemporary poets, say Swinburne, George Meredith, shall I say also Matthew Arnold, except for, for that one poem. I am I'm not a literary historian, I'm a teacher, so I'm interested in, in poetry that convinces my, my students to fall in love. I have two students who decided to study English literature because they heard when they were in high school, Walking Lonely as a Cloud of William Wordsworth. So that gives you an idea of a responsibility. That's why I think I will use some of Stevenson's poems. Anyway, I read and I found enough poems to put the rest the issue of whether Stevenson was or not a poet, a poetaster, a major, a minor, I don't care. You'll judge for yourself listening to Richard. Most of the poems writ most of these poems that I chose were written before and after his three poetry collections, which appeared in 1885, 1887, and 1890. I privileged instead the idea of setting his poetry writi writing along the parallel development of his essayistic and novelistic writing. So I created a chronological time frame from 1869 to 1894. This is a contribution. The hypothesis behind this perspective is based on a comment Stevenson makes in a November 1877, 1887 letter to John Addison Simmons, um, in which he comments on the public reaction to his adult poetry collection Underworld. I do not set up to be a poet, only an all round literary man. Hmm? He had, maybe it's a, a bit small, small perhaps, he had only written a couple of essays and he was all in, in 1874 and he was already describing himself as a person with a poetic character and no poetic talent. Never mind, his prose muse has all the ways of a poetic one and must take my essays as they come to me. Eh? And even before then, when he was a student, then he, he would walk around the countryside, in, around Edinburgh, and <coughs> sit down with, with his famous note, geometry notebook, sit down and with my mind, busy fitting what I saw with appropriate words. When I sat, a pencil and a penny version book would be in my hand to note down the features of the scene or commemorate some halting stanza. His mind was working uh, in these two media. Uh, uh, then in France, you see, uh, then he finally wrote his first essays, Note on Moment of Young Children, and his, this, this transition to, uh, to becoming an essay, a published essay, it all happened in France, in Menton, not in Bordeaux, unfortunately, but, but anyway, and he, but while he was writing these essays, while he was uh, writing his first short story, which is a, an, ep an episode in the life of Francois Villon, he wrote two essays on French poets, not only poets, and he was experimenting with Triolet, Rondeau, and other friends. So I'm saying his mind was developing a lot like But 1869, before all this happened, he wrote one of his most a beautiful poem that a young man. Prego, too many. Too many with a hand glass. A picture frame for you to fill, a poultry setting for your face, 
a thing that has no worth until you lend it something of your grace I send. Unhappy I that sing laid by a while upon the shelf, because I would not send a thing less charming than you are yourself. And happier than I, alas, dumb thing I envy its delight. Twill wish you well, the looking glass, and look you in the face tonight. Speaking of and for a mirror, for the hand glass. Hmm? Uh, I love this poem, especially because of this, the first stanza. You really have a sense that a that, uh, metrical unit is, is the stanza itself. It, it, it rushes through, and, and which is, of course, in the best John Donne and every tradition, all in tetrameters. Uh, ten years later, during his travels, he's in Oakland, California, and he writes his <laughs> one of his most famous well, this, this poem was then um, included in, um, in Underwoods in 1887, but they mark the, the career. And uh, Richard, tighten up. <laughs> <laughs> Under the wide and starry sky, dig the grave and let me lie. Glad did I live and gladly die, and I laid me down with a will. This be the verse you grave for me. Here he lies where he longs to be. Home is the sailor, home from sea, and the hunter, home from the hill. Okay, uh, here he is, he is using uh, a particular his meter. Uh, you see they have one stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllable, eh? it's called a, a dactyl or a croaky, so it's a descending rhythm under the wide and starry sky, big the great. And then in the final line of each stanza, this is a mirror structure, he has, he, he turns to the I am and he, and the, and the lines rhyme each other. So this again, again, um, then he, we have his uh, production. So my problem is that usually when you read discussions of Stevenson, you, the, 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 the critics focus on the uh, collection. The collection not necessarily contains the best poetry, and, uh, but what we have, we have a continuous sequence, 1881-1889, with the ballads, uh, in which he uh, dedicated himself to poetry. Uh, Charles Carson a verse with 66 po poems, 42 of them are rhyming couplet quatrains, eh? and then the others are uh, variations. Uh, um, while he was writing this collection, he wrote, of course, Treasure Island, but he also wrote this essay on some technical elements of style in literature. I opened, I returned to this essay hoping to find some important statements on poetry. Instead, you, you, I discovered that he was interested in the art of, of, of prose. The term versifier I use in the title comes from how he <laughs> defines poets in this essay. And Underwoods, uh, 1887, 54 poems. 38 in English, uh, mostly rhyming, rhyming octosyllables, and then uh, 16 in Scots. I don't, I'm not able to, to, to read some um, uh, in Scots, so I, I concentrated on the link part. A third of the English poems I rhymed epistles to relatives and friends. Uh, ballads is uh, the only case in which St Stevenson transformed experience and ideas into art before doing so in his essay. This uh, essay form is theistic, non-prose, uh, non-fictional non prose, and that was uh, uh, in the South East. As in uh, Charles Gardner words, even here, he limits himself basically to one or two poetic forms. In this case, the examiners, um, rhyming couplets, examiners, and, um, and then finally, 1876, 1894, Songs of Travel. These are poems that he never managed to publish. They appeared posthumously in the Edinburgh <coughs> Collected Edition, and then, and it contains some of his best poetry, certainly, in my opinion. Huh? Um, oh, but, uh, I know it's unfair 
to pick on Stevenson penny whistled, especially standing, sitting next to my friend Jean-Pierre Nogret. And we, but we already, I already cleared the, the issue beforehand. Um, but the problem is, David Deitchies claims that uh, Stevenson's poetry is only of biographical values. Oh, someone who, has, who thinks something like that has no problem in saying that he chose a poetic form suited to the young audience. I can't accept it, of course. Um, but I, I have to pick on, on, on uh, I, I came to like Charles Gardner verse as I, as I kept working it, but it is important to focus on it, and I will ignore the other two collections, because the little critical devo attention devoted to Stevenson's poetry is focused on uh, this collection. And then for, okay, um, important that inevitably in discussing poetry, we, we quote one stanza or one line, but it is important that in this case, we, we, he, we see what is it. This is a form that he replicated on th in three quarters of, of, of his poem. Eh? Um, I'm so good that I let, let him read one of his favorite uh, poems. But please, only a couple of, of stanzas. Eh? Not, I'm, I'm, I know that it's painful for you because... <laughs> Okay, li read it all. No, Come no, no, on. No, 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 no. Natalie, we'll, we'll, we'll spend some two extra two minutes, but I no, can't, no, I can't no, cut no, him off. No, no, read it all. <laughs> no, you, 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 from the way no, you no, read, he reads, you will realize how, how much pleasure he gets out of it. No? <laughs> <laughs> You'll see. When I was sick and lay abed, I had two pillows at my head, and all my toys beside me lay to keep me happy in the day. Sometimes for an hour or so I watched my leaden soldiers go in different uniforms and drills among the bedclothes through the hills and sometimes sent my ships in fleets all up and down among the sheets or brought my trees and houses out and planted cities all about. I was the giant, great and still, that sits upon the pillow hill and sees before him dale and plain Okay, uh, the rhyming couplets uh, in the four-beat ambit verse of Milton, Allegro Pensieroso, Marvel, or Dryden's and Pope's heroic verses are national treasures. Mm -hmm. But they were employed in continuous verses, long stanzas, not in quatrain. This is specific to Charles Gardner's of verse. It is, uh, I, it is a mystery why he did it, especially because uh, in, in a very important essay uh, of uh, um, fragment that uh, titled Random Memories, Rosa Co Locorum, and Robert Louis Evanson recently wrote about it, he, he goes back to his childhood and he talks about how he, uh, uh, he discovered the beauty, the power of, of words through Camus' reading of, of, uh, of Psalms, especially the 63rd Psalm, or oh, the 23rd, I don't remember, and he says, um, I to pass from Hebrew literature to reading it is to take a great and dangerous step. I read thenceforth by the eye alone and hear never, never again the chime of fair words or the march of the stately period. The psalm, this is a common me measure, which is also the, the form that we use, was used for the English ballads, hmm, is, of course, uh, one would have expected that to be more um, the form he would go to, since this is what the form that gave him a pleasure as a child. Instead, he uses this other one. Um, to give you an idea, th this is the, po the, the form that Emily Dickinson uses, not the, the three and four. Uh, uh, but this is an important point. There was a negotiation with Richard Dewey, and I, I to give you an idea of how um, wonderful, really, how interesting uh, a poem from Charles Gardner the verse can be once he breaks this mold and introduces in va variation. This is my kingdom. If you could please read one stanza or one stanza, two stanzas. Stanza, oh. okay, right. 
like a good first time. Down by the shining water well, I found a very little den, no higher than my head. The heather and the gorse about in summer bloom were coming out, some yellow and some red. See, if you look at the rhyme structure, rhyme scheme, no, he it's like th there's a uh, a couplet followed by a quatrain. It's like an inversion of a walking lo lonely as a cloud, and and it is uh, four four stresses and three stresses, no higher than my head. Down by shining water well, I found a very little dell, no higher than my head. What strikes me in this poem is that. He will put a full stop at the end of the third verse. So he is, I wish he's he in, in a, the sound is not that of a sixteen, but have two different triplets. In this, another case, um, in this case, we have uh, couplets, but we have um, three rhymes, three, three syllables, if two may read a right. These rhymes of old delight and house and garden play, you too, my cousin, and you only make a pentameter. So, I mean, variation, variety is the, 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 the key, is the key because, of course, a poet expresses a different feeling in each poem, so that's why the form changes. Uh, John Donne's John Donne's songs and sonnet, the 55 poems, all in one case, he replicates the same stanza form. That's how it is. Wordsworth experimented with 90 poetic forms. But what is interesting, and here Richard can get, give it all, this is, this is an example of how he would address directly a young reader in the years in which he was writing um, Charles Godwin verse. This is the epistle, that in the, the ep epigraph to Treasure Island. To my hesitating... If sailor tales to sailor tunes, storm and adventure, heat and cold, if schooners, islands and maroons, and buccaneers of buried gold, and all the old romance retold exactly in the ancient way can please, as me they pleased of old, the wiser youngsters of today, so be it, and fall on. If not, if studious youth no longer crave, his ancient appetites forgot, Kingston or Valentine the Brave or Cooper of the Wooden Wave, so be it also. And may I and all my pirates share the grave where these and their creations huh? lie. Yeah. Well, this is a perfect uh, quatrain parameter. Four, four quatrains, 16 lines all together, not divided into stanzas. One single sentence in the first eight lines. Huh? Um, now, what I, what I, what I've been doing, and what I'm doing in in, in conversation with Penny, I am raising the problematics of the speaker's voice and the poem's forms, no, which are crucial to my ideal Stevenson, because I mean the voice of the of the essayist and the experimenter in difference of two documents related to Underwood. Woods, uh, his 1818, um, uh, are of crucial importance. The first one is Simon, the letter to, letter to Simon's I've already quoted. The second is Edmund Goss's review of the collection in which he comments both on the voice of Underwoods and the form of a child's garden of verse. I do not set up to be a poet, only an all-round literary man, a man who talks, not one who sings, but I believe the very fact that it was only speech served the book with the public. Hmm? The phrase all around literary men, man, and this phrase I find a confirmation of my hypothesis regarding Stevenson's threefold artistic identity. We know that his ambition was not to compete with poets, um, with versifiers, um, but it's by 1884. In 1887, Let's 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 be honest. He scraped he has scraped the bottom of the bar barrel for Underwoods, and and uh, he had emphasized, exaggerated with his personal voice, personal form. He dedicates this book to collection to eighteen physicians who 
cured him during his life. But there is mysteries Stevenson will do to himself. But he has the honesty of distinguishing between those who talk and those who sing. He is in between. He hasn't completed the, tra the transition. And the readers want him, want to hear his voice. He want, they want to hear the voice of the essayist and the, and the novelist in his poetry. And he said, in fact, if the book, if the collection has gone into a second edition, it was only because uh, the readers want, for its prose merits, Nobody else speaks like that of uh, one's poetry, no? But it, this is the uniqueness of, of Stevenson. Mm? Um, those who talk and those who sing. I took the liberty of, of, of laying down an ace and using Jonathan Culler's, uh, Culler's equal theory of lyric, lyric, and he's, he, he, he uses the terms voice and voicing. Create those are lyrics that tend to sound like someone speaking, and this is what subjectively Stevenson thought he was doing, or instead who create effects of voicing in the echoing of rhyme, assonance, alliteration, and rhyming part pattern. Here we have a matter of, this is where his identity as an essayist sort of dampens, limits his thing. Okay. Um, Lewis provides evidence of what it mean, meant to be an all-around literary man um, when, he, when he notes that Stevenson began with a prose sketch, turning it into a rhyming autosyllable or blank verse only after running, running it, roughing it out, what he wanted to say. What he wanted to say, hmm? speaking, saying something, narrating instead of creating a uh, a form. Mm. Um, Edmund Goss. Edmund Goss was the only important published poet among in the circle of uh, um, his Stevenson's friends. And here, this review. He he, he didn't review Charles Gardner verse, but he re reviewed um, Underwood. And in this review, uh, with friends like these who needs enemies, he comments on the couplets that. Stevenson uses in Charles Gardner numbers. In, in, this, in that collection, he shows to be ex exceedingly happy and very much himself in that meter of eight and seven syllables, eh? which serves so well the first poets, poets who broke away from heroic verse, meaning rhyming couplets in five stress uh, verses in pentameter, such as Swift. Uh, uh, the Countless of, of Winchesley, Matthew Gleam, and John Dyer. I had never heard about them, no? And then he said, if he must be affiliated to any school of poets, it is to these who hold the first, hold the first outwork between the old classical camp and the invad invading army of Roman, Romance to whom I should ally him. Affiliate and ally, the classicist and the romantic, but he didn't use the term romantic, he, term, he used the term romance, which is, of course, Stevenson himself. And so there's a contradiction. How is it that the champion of romance would choose a form such as this one? And then he goes on. Uh, and this time he talks sorry, about Richard, Underwood. Richard, Richard, Underwood. Can I ask you to conclude? What? Can I ask you to conclude, please? To conclude? Yes. Uh, I'll conclude. I'll stand up and let go. <laughs> I won't conclude.